All right. So I apologize. As I said before, I, I just patched up those slides just before class, so I knew I knew they they look bad, and sorry about that. So in fact, I just added a additional slide, which is actually complementing uh, the explanation I, I gave before, which was lacking this particular aspect. So um, kernels. We didn't talk about kernels. Again, I apologize. So let, let, let's see what are these guys. Uh, in this case, we are going to be using one-dimensional data. Okay, everything is going to be just fine as we use two-dimensional data, which are kind of images. Images are kind of 2.5 because they have also some thickness, right? But you can think about images as two-dimensional data, not spatial data. So here we think about 1D data, and we said we go from one layer to the other layer by using these kernels, which apply first here, then the same kernel, so the kernel is the collection of these three weights. I apply this guy to the second chunk here, and to the third chunk, okay? So this is the same guy, which is uh, applied to different locations, because we, uh, again, exploit the fact that we are using data which is stationary, stationary, okay? The same feature can appear in different locations of the uh, data, which is spatial location, is temporal location, we don't care, but it's in different regions of your of your data. All right, so... Question before we go on. Uh, is this usually normal that you have less um, neurons or is this for illustration only? Okay, that's, that is also correct. Yes, I apologize. Right, so uh, whenever you apply convolution, you're going to be uh, lacking a neuron here because otherwise, where would you send this connection to, right? So I would have this connection and I don't have anything here. So there is another technique which is called zero padding, which you're going to be adding as many zeros here and here so that you're going to have the same number of neurons every layer. This is what we are doing basically most of the time. So or you, you can, have... Or you can do cyclic and then you will remove the problem. Yes, but it doesn't... That's not, that's not, that's not right? It doesn't work if you have images. You don't... If you end up one side of the image, you cannot see the other one coming in, right? So it doesn't really work for images, for example. Um, most of the time, we just do zero padding, which means I add as many zeros as here and here and here as the number of kernels divided by two floor. So here we have three divided by two, 1.5, floor one. So I add one more zero here, one more zero here, so that I have five neurons here, I have five neurons here, okay? So in theory, I mean, in, usually convolution won't change the dimensionality. Uh, if they do, it's because I didn't pad my input, okay? You can pad, you can decide not to pad. Um, I don't quite get it. You can add it and just send it to three. It's, it, this is on your picture that's in the middle of three, but you know, you can connect the next one with the three of this, you just don't have more new. Or you mean, since it's the same kernel, it will be a duplicate, oh, okay. Okay. Okay, I didn't understand what you said, but I'm happy you understood <laughs> what you said. All right. All right, so again, here we have uh, that we go from this layer to this layer by using this kernel, which is the collection of these three colors, over and over and over again, okay? So this one here is my first kernel associated to this layer. Of course, we can have multiple kernels per layer, but I didn't mention that. So here we have my second blue kernel, the blue, purple, and the pink. And so this one, given that we have two kernels associated to this specific layer, is going to make these guys here not, not scalar anymore, but they are R2 guys, right? The first element is associated to the convolution with this first kernel. So I have these three guys multiplied by these three and sum. I have first value. I have these three guys multiplied by three guys sum together. I have second value. These three guys multiply by these three, sum together a third, third value. This is the first item in the R here. Second one, second item, is going to be containing the scalar product, the projection, on this kernel with the input. Okay? So we are going to have here, this number here represents the thickness of this layer. So these balls are coming, somehow coming out from the screen. Yeah? So these different kernels, are they taking the same like inputs from the previous layer? So is, is, it, is it that the inputs are the same and the weights are different, or is it the inputs are different? The first one. Okay. So since you see there are different colors, yeah. they are different numbers. But here you have all these guys are the same guy. 
the, the same input, right? So you have your signal here, distributed across five samples. And here you multiply this guy with the first kernel. So you have, your, you have like a projection, right? So whenever you do a projection, you see how much of this kind of feature is located in here. And this is the first answer. So this one tells you what is the projection of this first location of your input with this kernel. So you have a kernel and you have your input. You do the projection of your input on that kernel. You have the first output here. Then you do the nonlinearity so you can go on. Instead, this guy here is going to be another kernel space on which you project, again, your input data. So here we have two kernels. Therefore, these guys are not scalars, but they are vectors right, of size 2. And here we are using three connections. And therefore, I have three values within my kernel. So we have number 3 here because there are the connection. We have 2 because there are two different kernels. Okay. Yes? No? Yeah, question. Uh, can, can we have a different kernel with like, different features? So, like four values in one kernel? As two? Uh, different sizes. Yeah. Yes, you can. But then you're going to be changing your network. So you're going to have your network, which is branching out. And it's going to have like four branches, for example. And each branch has its own size. But each convolutional layer has the same number of uh, items in a kernel. In every kernel, you have the same number of guys because it's going to be just a tensor. I'm going to show you soon. soon. But again, if you'd like to have different receptive fields, then you have different branches in your network. You can easily do that in, in PyTorch. You simply send your same, same input to different convolutional <coughs> kernels, and at the end, you may concatenate everything. Okay? Yes? Um, how do you avoid ending up with kernels that are essentially you know, have very, very similar weights that are really the same thing? Uh, good question. Uh, so <laughs> as long as you initialize uh, these guys with round numbers, and it's very likely these two guys are randomly, uh, they are two different numbers. So whenever you have your uh, weight space, your weight, uh, your weight, weight, weight space, those guys are different points. And those guys are going to be stepping towards wherever uh, the, the loss is going to go to the zero, right? So you have this guy here, given that I start here, and the other guy starts here. Both of them are trying to step in order to minimize the function, but they are still far away. It's very unlikely that they're going to be uh, hitting each other, matching, because this stuff has a lot of up and down. So one will stop here, the other one will stop a different uh, location. But they may end up being. Yeah. Uh, that you know there's some certain number of local minima in your weight space. What if you start with more kernels than there are local minima in your Then weight definitely space? you're going to have some uh, col uh, um, kernels colliding to the same, uh, okay. same solution. All right. So yeah, that was supposed to be very short. OK, right. Um, <laughs> uh, three connections, two kernels. One more thing. Five input, right? Who said those are scalars? This can be also the output of another convolution, and they may be five dimensional. So if we are, let's say, in a RGB image, this is going to be number three. So every pixel has a R and G and B component. So this number is going to be three. Uh, if these are whatever, they're going to have different features. So in each location, the descriptor at that specific location has a specific dimension, dimensionality. So as you can understand now, these, are, these guys here are also five-dimensional, given that we had to project this guy on here, right? So we have these three guys, which are five, uh, 15 elements now. They are going to be scalar product uh, with this guy here, which is also three in this direction and five in this direction, right? So finally, you can, collapse, uh, col you can collect all your kernels in some tensor, which is of dimension 3. So we have two kernels, 1 and 1, 2, of five elements, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, times three neurons. So first row, second row, and third row. So anytime you deal with one-dimensional data, you are going to be ending up with collection of kernels which are three-dimensional uh, tensors. Number of kernels, number of input features, five, and number 
three of output. Uh, sorry, the this this special. Uh, huh. Yeah, this connection number of connections. So, for example, before we were saying we are go we are going from one image, one layer input image, the grayscale, to six uh, six layers, right? So we were having kerners that were five by five because we are dealing with images and they have dimension of one, right? In this case, because my input has just one layer. So it's one times five times five. How many of these we have? We said six, right? So in two dimensions, like when we play with, with um, images, this guy here is gonna be six times one times five times five. That was the first convolutional module. Second guy here, we have kerners that now gets an input which has six dimensions. So this guy has to be six by five by five. How many do we have? Also we have six. So this guy here is gonna be six times six times five times five. So uh, one dimensional data, three dimensional uh, tens, uh, kernel, collection of kernels. Two dimensional data, four dimensional kernels. Three dimensional data, Yay, you understood, right? So pay attention. One dimensional data uses 3D kernels and so on. Yes, please. Uh, the kernel is actually like, like each line is supposed to be the weight, right? Well, what about the biases? Uh, so these are, the bias is gonna be just R2 times three here, right? So I have each of these will have a bias term. Ah, so the bias term goes to the, to uh, so the node, not to the... Yeah, yeah, the bias is like the offset, right? So basically, uh, let me think. Um, I think there are just... Uh, yeah, just two. Because just two for each Just two, two right? Yeah, so yeah. One, one bias for the first layer and one bias for the <laughs> other one, right? Other quick, yes? So if you have another set of parentheses with three different colored yeah. stars, that would be... Three by five by three? So it's gonna be, yeah, three by five by three. Okay. If you have seven kernels, yeah. you're gonna have seven kernels, five, because it's where you start, and you end up in, uh, you have a size of three, right? Okay, okay. Uh, okay. I was just thinking, uh, the, uh, uh, the fact that uh, she raised that uh, there can be minimum, various minimas in that weight space, and since you initialize them randomly, each of them are, are expected to converge to one of those minima, right, with the gradient. But I was just thinking if we can, in this dynamics of training, like evolution, if we add uh, some things like each uh, weight point, which which represents each kernel, I guess, uh, repel each other, kind of in that weight, uh, in that uh, uh, in that dynamics as well. I think that would ensure no, uh, like ensure that even if there are like. Uh, Less number of or, or same number. Of, I mean, it will ensure that uh, two uh, kernels don't converge to a similar. Right, right. So if you add additional terms to the loss, then the uh, network will try to perform well for whatever you ask. But usually, what I like is to perform good on that, that specific loss I define. So if you add additional terms, I will do worse in the other task because I have additional terms I have to deal with. Uh, but you can try to have additional terms and see how you can com like introduce like complexity in this kind of uh, optimization problem. Yeah. So that was just to show you that uh, every layer here has uh, a, co a collection of kernels which are limited for the amount of connections and they have uh, non definitely not scalar. They don't have to be scalar values. Okay. That was just uh, for compl for completeness. Uh, we are going to go back to the uh, Notebook example where we have seen, we have trained the convolutional net, we have trained the fully connected network, both of them have the same number of parameters, but we have seen that the convolutional network performs much better than the fully connected layer. Uh, because we are, again, exploiting those three uh, specific uh, property of the data, which were, no one is listening. Locality. Stationarity and one more. Composition. There you go. So given that there are these three uh, specific characteristics, we we exploit them in order to improve performance, as we have seen. Uh, what does it happen if we don't have those three uh, 
uh, assumption working, I mean, th if those three assumptions are not any more valid, what does it happen? We're going to be seeing that soon. Are you ready? Are you excited? Should be. So, yeah, just uh, as Alfredo said, uh, we trained a fully connected neural network and the convolutional neural network with the same number of parameters. And we've seen that uh, the uh, thanks. CNNs perform much better. Um, and what happens if we, uh, we made some like assumptions uh, when we like constructed the convolutional neural net, which is the stationarity, locality, and the Compositionality. Uh, what if what happens if we remove uh, relax those assumptions? And we can test that by permuting our data. So the data that we used in the previous task looked uh, like this: the first top rows, which um, basically the handwritten digits. Um, those are actual grayscale images, but we um, plot it in color, and we just scramble it uh, by using the by flattening it. it uh, to the 726 uh, component factor, 784 con component factor, and applying the random permutation, and then putting it back to the square um, image. It looks like this, so we don't see any uh, numbers anymore. But can it tell, it's this, uh, the same permutation, so can it tell um, what it was? And we simply going to, uh, uh, train the convolutional neural net on the data with permuted pixels. And here's what we get. Uh, we do see the training, so loss, uh, the training loss is reducing. Um, the training ac accuracy was good, but the generalization, the, 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 the test loss was uh, low, 80%. Sorry, the, the test accuracy was 80%. Uh, we will see. It's, it's, I would say it's quite high for the images as they looked. <laughs> um, let's see how the fully connected uh, network performs. It's 89%. That let's, uh, I'm, um, we don't remember how it was in the previous, so let's just plot it. All right, so we see that the, for convolutional neural network, uh, sorry, for, for fully connected neural network, it's the first and the last beans. Nothing actually happened, and in fact, if you repeat it, uh, the training multiple times and average it, uh, you will see that it's actually almost exactly the same. Um, for the convolutional net, we see a significant performance uh, penalty. It, uh, the performance reduced by over 10%. So that's what happens uh, when we uh, basically remove the assumptions that made convolutional neural network work so well on the on images. All right. Questions? It's a very general question. I'm not sure I understand. When you randomly scramble, this is, uh, I'm not quite sure I understand what it means. <coughs> what, what, if I then write four, will it make out four, or I have to scramble it and then in the same way. So we know uh, we know the label, right? So we know I the know. image of four is four. But um, when we see an image of four, we see uh, basically local patterns. The pixels nearby have the same intensity, right? And we see the edges and um, basically back when Alfredo was talking about the cat picture. Uh, when we scramble it, we don't no longer have locality, right? The, pic uh, the pixels nearby are different, but we still we still know that it's a four. But that's right. But uh, like next time, if somebody writes four and fits it, will it say it's four or first I have to scramble it in the same way 
Yeah, you have to apply the same. You have to apply the same scrambling uh, transformation, right? Same implementation oh, yeah. with fixed random seeds. Yeah. Oh. The whole point is to show that if those assumptions we had before of locality, stationarity, and decompositionality uh, are not any more valid because we scramble the position, is we don't we cannot exploit anymore that specific uh, characteristic of the input in order to improve performance. Whereas the fully connected layer doesn't have any assumptions, so connection you can scramble them; they are still the same connections, right? <coughs> you have to preserve the scrambling. Oh yes, of course. Yeah. That's a uh, that's a deterministic. It's not anymore, just labels. Yes, it's a deterministic scrambling of the pixels. Yeah, I don't I don't really know how to phrase this as a question, but it just like those don't look any different, right? Like uh, which one it does? It, well, like, pretty much. <laughs> yeah. So like, you, even if like the label is still the same. Like how it's surprising that that it could easily that with like eighty percent accuracy be like, oh yeah, that middle one, that's a four. The one just to the right of it, that's a one. That's why convolutional neural network works so well. They can do magic even though we try to uh, kill them, right? Because it's still you can still think uh, the convolution, the fully convol the convolutional neural net. The convolution. Oh? The convolutional neural net. You can still think about it as being, you know, a fully connected layer for those central pixels, right? So, although we have so many parameters that the network managed to learn something even without using the neighboring information. So right now, every kernel is just tuned to find these specific pixels in these specific locations. So that's why they still it still performs fine-ish, 85 percent. I don't know whatever. The scrambling is random. No, the, the scram no, the, the, the scrambling is a deterministic function. Okay. So, so every time you scrambling. have the same scrambling. Okay. It's just to show you that if I change the location of those pixels. The fully connected layer doesn't see it; it's the same. The, full, the convolutional neural net instead is going to perform worse. You don't have that more any more that advantage with respect okay. to the. So the scrambling here is that uh, basically with the random permutation, with the fixed uh, random seed, uh, and before we permute, we flatten the image, we permute it, the pixels, and then we put it back to the um, two D. Yes. Uh, my question, I think, goes back to the to the difference between the fully connected and the convolutional neural net in terms of like the training we did. If we would take the fully connected one and just run the training for more epochs, we could still get the same, uh, but with uh, with the convolutional one. No. Uh, so, if you have the same number of parameters the modeling power of the convolutional network on natural uh, data is much higher. So given the same number of free parameters for both models, the convolutional neural net can ex uh, exploit those parameters much, much more because you, it doesn't use those extra parameters to try to figure out connection with further away uh, values or with you know different kernels in every position. So you can use better, you can reuse your parameters in order to extract multiple uh, in multiple locations the same kind of feature. So convolutional neural net, given the same number of parameters and given that you can uh, deal with data, which is, again, uh, have those three kind of uh, main assumptions valid, then it's going to be having a higher modeling power. On the other side, if you have the same modeling power, so convolutional neural net and uh, a fully connected layer, uh, fully connected network, which perform the same with the same uh, accuracy, then you're going to figure out that the convolutional neural net has much, 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 much less parameters. So yeah, given you to, to add to what Alfredo just said, uh, as you can see from the result, actually the fully connected uh, network had pretty high training accuracy. That's kind of along the lines with what you said. If we train it, we can get very high training accuracy, but the generalization power will be very bad. And on the test set, it's actually pretty low, which means with the same number of trainable parameters, the, these are less meaningful, uh, as Alfredo said. So one could devise a strategy where you start with a fully connected network, and then you see which weights they go to zero, or they go close, really close to zero, and use that as a way to guide your convolutional uh, architecture. No? Potentially. But then, uh, if you just start with many less weights, you're much faster. You have many less computations. Yeah, but maybe you didn't put enough. Oh, OK. So every time, OK, sure. Uh, this, this, I could have a full course here. 
Initially, you're going to be increase your dimensionality of your network, perhaps increasing these uh, six here. As soon as you notice, I mean, uh, you have to increase it until you see here 100%. So you go and increase your model capacity uh, up to the point where it is 100% able to uh, model your training data. But then it's going to be performing very poorly on the validation set because it's going to be basically memorizing your input data. And that's when you are actually introducing uh, other regularizing techniques, let's say, namely dropout, which is somehow taking off, uh, turning off some neurons, or you're even maybe willing to use batch normalization, which is not a regularizing technique, but it works as a regularizer. So again, you can use, you should be using all the time batch norm because it performs uh, some kind of regularization uh, as a byproduct, but it's also going to be speeding up your training at the time, your training procedure. So first, you try to overfit your training set. After, when you're sure that you can uh, completely fit your training set, you start adding regularization uh, blocks, which are going to be making you improve performance on the validation set. And when you reach the highest validation accuracy uh, or the lowest, valida um, lowest validation loss, you stop there. And this is like the cross-validation uh, technique. So actually about batch norm, it will speed up convergence, but the training itself, time per epoch, won't be sp sped up. It will speed the yeah, training. Yeah, of course, yes. speeds up convergence. <laughs> yeah, sure. Uh, and it also performs this regularization, which again, I should tell you more why it does. So if someone asks you, asks you, no, in a let's say in a job job interview, ha, huh, is batch normalization a regularization technique? Your answer is going to be no, but it performs regularization as a byproduct. <coughs> Bless you. All right. Any other question? <coughs> no. Yes. So, well, you know, what is the information that a fully connected network can learn from a picture? Just uh, how many pixels are? Of one color with respect to right, right, right. So, so if you think about that, um, can you scroll to the 700 something number? Where is the 700? Uh, you mean. There's a number. There you go. Here. This one? So, this number here, you can think one image of those numbers yes. is one point in a 784 dimension. And then those neural networks are simply moving those points in different regions so that the last layer can just chop them with linear lines, with, with the hyperplanes. So they all, the only thing we have seen that yesterday, right? Whenever you have those neural networks, you are de warping basically the space. And in this case, you have a 784 dimensional space with those dots. Each dot is representing a specific image. You're just moving things around so that they are all together <laughs> in different regions. And then you just carve out that region in order to tell, oh, that number belongs to that class. So that's how the fully connected layer works. The other one does something similar, but has a more principal way because it deals with the, uh, those other properties of the images that we mentioned before. Yes? Um, are there like ways to use, um, to like within the framework we have here, to sort of, you feed it, and you like just one image and see what it pops, to like to test the, what you trained at the end? As opposed to just say, oh, okay, cool. I know that it's 94% accurate. Can you, can you like, Sort of simply just give it things and see. Yes, what yes, of course. So yeah. that's actually here. If you scroll down to the uh, test loop or wherever the test loop is. You want a test loop? Test loop is here. Right, so this is testing loop. So you just get your um, model, you provide here a. So you get data, you, just, you can just write your number on a piece of paper. You just take a, a picture with your phone. Yeah. You resize it um, to 28 by 28. Then you just, you know, you do a NumPy image load, something like that. And then you put it here. And this guy is going to be spitting you out the probability. So the, the probability distribution over the 10 classes is going to tell you uh, how likely that drawing you made is going to be uh, respecting one of the uh, 10 digits. So you, you can actually do that. Or maybe, okay, next time I'm going to be adding, I can add one extra cell. Okay, I'll do that. Uh, tonight, I add extra cell where you can actually load your image and, and perform there a test. Any other question? If not, thank you for listening, and I'll see you, I guess, tomorrow for one more lesson on machine learning. Thank you.